Hey guys, good morning. Um, we're going to go over the lecture here for chapter 14. We're going to begin with the prayer in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I hope everybody's doing well. I just wanted to go through the chapter 14 on water resources with you. And here is um, that PowerPoint that you have, and hopefully you've already gone through that, so we can talk about these different aspects here. So the first thing um, when we're talking about water resources is um, where is this water found? And I've included a few additional um, figures that are not on the slideshow, but they are in your textbook um, as terms of what water um, sources we have. And so the first thing is um, fresh water. And what that means, fresh water is water that does not contain salt. So ocean water is salt water, marine water. Fresh water is, um, does not contain salt or contains very little bit of salt relative to salt water. And obviously it's one of the most important resources that um, peoples and communities have. Um, it is a renewable resource, um, a term there that means it can come back and it can be re um, recharged. And it is also limited though. There's only a certain amount of water and water is valuable um, to every uh, person on the planet. And I did want to pull up an additional diagram here. This is found on page 420 in your book at the very beginning of chapter 14. But it shows you the distribution of water on the planet. You can see that if this pie chart here represents all water, 97.5% um, of that is salt water. And that's water you can't drink with, you can't uh, fertilize, or you can't water your plants with it. Um, it's obviously a lot. It means more than 70% of the earth is made up of water, but that's water you can't use for most of the things that we use water for because it contains too much salt. So about two and a half percent of the water on earth is fresh water. Think about how much um, water is on the planet and only a small percentage of that is fresh water. And then if we look at that percentage and see, well, okay, well, where is that fresh water found? It is also a lot of it is unavailable because it's either frozen as a glacier or an ice cap or it's groundwater. So only this tiny sliver right here, this dark green sliver right there is um, fresh water that is surface water. So that would be water that's found in lakes, water that's found in rivers, um, in the atmosphere, or even in the soil. Um, so you can see that available fresh water is very, very scarce. Um, so it's a limited resource, but it is renewable. So we'll go back here. Now, surface water is one of the concepts here when we talk about fresh water and surface water is the idea of a watershed. Here's a map of the United States with major rivers. Um, think about the surface of a land and how does it shed water into the lowest spot, which forms a stream or a creek, and then all of those eventually pool together and run together to form a river. So that is a watershed, and that's a key vocabulary term for this chapter. Um, so I'll just uh, read you the definition real quick. A watershed includes all of the land area that supplies water to a particular river system. All of the land area that supplies water to a particular river system. So, um, you know, we have the, the Appalachian Mountains right here on the east coast of the United States. And you can imagine if a drop of water falls to the eastern side of the Appalachian Mountains, then it's going to flow to the Atlantic Ocean. If it falls to the western side of the Appalachian Mountains, then it's going to fall to the Gulf of Mexico, or it's going to, it's going to shed off to the Gulf of Mexico. Those, that's the continental divide. That's what we, uh, that's what that term means. And, and so there's one, there's a continental divide that runs the eastern portion of the United States. There's also one of the Rocky Mountains too. Um, so you may know that the major river systems in uh, the Midwest and all uh, all come together to the Mississippi River, which is kind of the main water line out of the central United States. Um, so every land area is part of some watershed, and I did want to look up some of Georgia's major river systems here. Um, we, of course, live in the Savannah River watershed. So you can see how that runs the border between Georgia and South Carolina. And if you lived all the way up here in North Georgia, or down here towards Savannah, 
and anywhere in between, like Augusta, then we would be a part of the um, Savannah River watershed. And so that's our river system, and that's where our water goes. Um, I just pulled that up. It is not in your textbook. All right, groundwater. What is groundwater? Groundwater is water that is has filtered through the soil, and you know now some soil properties as to what water, um, how water moves through soil. Remember that um, the sand, silt, and clay can impact permeability. Um, and inside of the surface of the earth, this is like, a, you know, this rock is porous, and the different sizes of, of the materials can increase the porosity or not. Um, and so you're going to have this layer of water. I don't know why I keep doing that. You'll have this layer of water, um, and that's called the water table. And if you are someone who um, has, has a well on your property, or if you have a farm that you go to that has a well on it, that well has to reach down all the way down into that water table in order to find water and pump it up. Um, so anywhere where water can uh, flow and these low spots are going to be called recharge zones. And those recharge zones are going to allow the water to settle into the ground. Um, and so groundwater will eventually, or surface water will eventually become groundwater if it's um, able to sit and permeate through the soil. Now that um, water that goes into the river systems will eventually go into the ocean and then that's going to combine to make um, salt water. Of course, rainwater, that um, part of the water cycle that brings water back up, that will be fresh water. An aquifer is the term for any groundwater. Um, yeah, it's basically a groundwater lake. Um, so where these large rock formations, they're not solid, they have a holes in them, and they can um, hold water. That is section 14.1. And now let's go on to 14.2, uh, which details uh, the uses of fresh water. It should be no surprise. Um, what are some of the uses you can see here? This would be uh, personal use and domestic water use, water that comes in um, through your pipes. But there's also agricultural, that's going to be a huge use of water in industrial. So how do factories and plants use water? Plants as in like um, buildings, not the organism. Okay, most fresh water in the United States is a surface water. S uh, surface water is diverted by canals and dams. We, of course, have those here in Augusta. Um, and so here you can see um, this is a, a, a shot of... The uh, aerial sea, and you can see over time what has happened here is that surface water has been used up. Um, so think about it, what are some industrial uses if you have a factory? Um, that factory is going to use a lot of water. Power plants use a lot of water. Uh, I did want to talk about surface water here in uh, dams. There's a good table on 429, page 429 in your textbook, uh, which I couldn't find a exact copy of, but here's a, a similar table that talks about the cost and the benefits of having a dam. So I just wanted to read through a few of these. Uh, dams are going to be an obstruction in the waterway that's going to flood upstream of the dam to hold water back or impound water. And there has many uses for a dam, for example, hydroelectric power. That's a that's one that the, the dam up there, the Thurman Dam at Clarks Hill does. You could have water uh, for flood control, and that's part of what some of these dams do even around here. You can have recreation opportunities. You can hold water to use for domestic use or for agricultural uses. Those are positive things. Um, dams majorly impact the ecosystem. They alter habitats. You're going to prevent fish migration. Uh, and, and then, you know, you think about the area where people lived. They live along water, river systems. And if you flood an area, you're going to displace all those people. Um, so you're going to lose a lot of fertile farmland and potentially cultural um, aspects. Um, and there's also some risk associated, associated with them. You could have um, potential problems with the, if the dam ever bursts. Um, and that is the table on 429. Uh, surface water depletion and freshwater depletion. We want to talk about um, desalinization and then uh, using less water. So how do we... Um, manage this or how do we mitigate any of these um, freshwater 
limited resource uh, supplies. So desalinization is one of the key terms here, and it refers to taking the salt out of water. So if you, uh, you probably knew this from elementary school, but you know, if you boiled salt water, the water will evaporate, the salt will stay behind. So if you could boil that water off in a controlled environment and then using a lot of heat, and then capture that, um, that steam and then condense it back down to water, you'll have fresh water and you'll, you'll leave the salt water behind. There's other ways, reverse osmosis would be another way to do that. So that would be taking fresh wa or salt water and turning it into fresh water. And, and that would be valuable if you live near the ocean, right? Coastal, coastal communities could do that. They have massive water supplies. And if they had the infrastructure to remove the salt or desalinate the water, then they could use it for domestic and agricultural uses. Um, plenty of ways to decrease use, change the way you irrigate, use plants that don't need as much water, conserve an industrial process, recycle your water. So one of the terms is this gray water is, is like this water that's been used that you may not drink, but it could be used for things over and over again. Um, so there's a lot of ways you could do that. All right, last section is pollution. Water pollution. Um, there are two major types of pollution, point source pollution and non-point source pollution. So really it's a matter of does it come from a specific spot or is it just from a, a huge variety of places in general? So if it comes from a pipe or a factory, someplace that's you know specific, then it is point source solution. Uh, but if you have some like runoff from a from a major highway or a parking lot, or you know you just have these things that kind of just their fertilizer runoff they might be all really, really spread out, and it's hard to specifically identify where they come from. That's non-point source. Um, and another aspect here of water pollution is when you get too much nutrients or too much fertilizer in a water system. And so that process is called eutrophication. And this would happen anywhere, like uh, if there's a golf course where you have... Um, they're using fertilizers, and then that, if they use too much fertilizers, that fertilizer can run off and get into the river system, or you're going to have aquatic plants grow. They're going to um, increase in population. They're going to bloom, and uh, algae and aquatic plants will do that. They'll grow quick because of the fertilizers. But then when they die off, they are decomposition, and the bacteria that break them down will suck up all the oxygen out of the water, and you'll have um, a lot of fish kills in that area. So the process of eutrophication is basically too much fertilizer causes a huge production of plant and algae life. Then when those die, the bacteria that decompose them are going to suck a lot of oxygen out of the water and then we'll be there. Toxic chemical pollution, of course, this is no surprise there. You could imagine that uh, people uh, for a long, long time have been dumping chemicals into water either to get them, get rid of them or to clean um, uh, their equipment. Uh, but you can also have things that maybe are not as obvious, like sediment pollution. And this is one of the aspects that dams can do. Dams can tra trap sediment that would normally flow. Sediment is just the small pieces of soil and, um, and particles that are in water. And sediment is a major pollution. Like if you've ever seen those black fences that are set up along highways where there's a construction site, those tiny little silt fences uh, where there's the wooden stakes between them, those are designed to trap sediment that uh, from rushing off of a construction site because whenever you have bare soil you're going to have the erosion and the uh, washing away of these sediments and they can cloud up water they can get into um, they can decrease the amount of photosynthesis that happens because they're clouding up the water and they can also get into the gills of fish and other aquatic organisms you can have thermal pollution too so the temperature of water can change so when you have factories that use water to cool their equipment or to cool materials they can um, actually put water in that's too hot. Hot water holds less oxygen. You can see a lot of these things are tied back to oxygen in the water. Biological pollution, getting um, bugs in here, microorganisms and microbes that can um, be in water. And these things can grow around. Cholera is a big one. Cholera are bacteria. And um, these can be in dirty water systems. So if you are part of your system is not clean, then um, you could be sick. Groundwater pollution, you can see there when you have uh, chemicals and things in your water that don't break down, they will leach through the surface and then into the soil and then through that 
the soil horizons as they get into groundwater and that takes a long time to clean up. Ocean's a big one. There's plastics in the ocean. You can have uh, oil spills. We uh, remember that there's been oil spills throughout um, our lifetime and uh, we definitely have seen a bunch of those. Controlling water pollution, you can see the, the, role, the role of a lot of this. The, the big lit, uh, legislation to get, uh, for this is the Clean Water Act of 1972 where basically the government set standards for what could and could not be in water and um, provided some infrastructure and some penalties if people did not uh, follow through on that. All right, the last bit here is wastewater treatment or water treatment, um, taking water from the river and making it able to drink and then taking water from your homes that have sewage in them or factories or commercial use and putting them back into river systems once they've been cleaned. Um, the diagram here is on page 442 in your book and it's a uh, pretty good, it goes through the steps of water treatment and this is one of the field trips that I want to take. Uh, well, hopefully we'll be able to maybe. Uh, but Highland Avenue right up the road has the big uh, water treatment facility for Augusta where water comes from the river and is cleaned and set through um, and sent out to your homes. So that's where the, it goes into the water towers. And then water has to be cleaned once it leaves your home. So it's a, it's a complete system. Water comes into the treatment facility. Then it goes through a process of getting it cleaned and chlorinated to drink. Then it goes to your home and then you use that water and then it goes out back to the wastewater treatment facility which is out near Bush Field and then it's cleaned again and returned back into the river. So from the river to the plant, to your house, back to another plant, and then back to the river. So that is the notes from chapter 14. I hope this lecture helps and that you guys are doing well at home. Miss you guys and um, we're going to get through this. Have a good day.